our series through uh, Revelation, and today we're uh, tackling Revelation chapter 14, uh, and I invite you to follow along as we read from, from God's Word this morning, uh, beginning with verse 1. And then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his Father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of wa rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of a harpist playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast in his image, or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for distance at 1600 stadia. May God's blessing be on the reading of his word this morning. I don't have to, and you can't make me. Have you ever heard words like that before? You know, them there are, those are fighting words from little kids to parents, aren't they? Maybe we should ask if any of you kids ever said something like that. I don't have to, and you can't make me. Now, there's, there's other words that, that maybe aren't so far behind them that, that we might also hear things like, why should I? And, you know, sometimes those words are spoken in defiance, aren't they? Sometimes they're, they're spoken with the sense of, why should I, and you can't make me. But there's, there's another time that we might have those words cross our mind or be a feeling in our heart. And, and that can be, sometimes we get tired of doing good. And it's not words spoken in defiance, but it's just this feeling, why should I? Why should I keep doing what's right? Why should I keep being faithful? Why should I when nobody else seems to? And, and I expect that sometime in your journey of faith, perhaps you've had that thought cross your mind, why should I? Because there comes a point where because I said so just doesn't quite seem satisfying enough. Or just because it's the right thing to do just doesn't seem satisfying enough. And so we might wake up on a Sunday morning and think, 
I'm so tired. Why should I get up and go to church? I'm so tired. Why should I make time for Bible study tonight? I'm so tired. You know, I'm so busy. And, 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 and we might have those words that just kind of keep crossing our mind. But did you know that the devil's scheme, according to Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, is to wear out the saints? Now, if you look, I believe in the NIV translation, it says to oppress the saints, but the meaning of the word is to wear down. Just Let's just keep throwing things at them, keep throwing things at them, keep them busy, keep them involved in this and that, to where they just get wore down and they have no more energy, they have no more passion, they have no more enthusiasm, they have no more excitement about the things of God. In Revelation chapter 13, we kind of ended with this picture of the beast having victory over God's people. And, and we were kind of ended with a world situation that appears hopeless. Uh, and, and if you might, you might remember the advice that we were given or the uh, command we were given in chapter 13. Uh, and, and it may not have been real appealing to us because it was endure patiently. Patience. Boy, that's something we don't really like a whole lot, is it? And most of us don't have a whole lot of it, do we? But he says, to endure patiently, be faithful, and seek wisdom. And sometimes we might ask that question, well, why sh should I? Why should I endure patiently? When it would be so much easier just to give in and to live like the rest of the world, to be like everybody else. Why should I endure patiently when it cost me to be faithful? Why should I seek wisdom when it contradicts the wisdom of the world and seems to cause more headache than it does good things? Anyone ever get tired of enduring patiently? You ever get frustrated when you, when you do the right thing and you're faithful and, and your hearts and your intention and your motivation is, is, is to honor God and to bless God and to do the things that he's called you to do and and somehow it seems to blow up in your face because you live in a world that's playing by a different set of rules? Or, or you get tired of being mocked, seeking wisdom that contradicts the wisdom of the world? Uh, we had an interesting conversation just this past week with uh, a friend from the old school days uh, who happens to be a, an atheist. And uh, one of the things that he said to us was, wouldn't it be better if you just weren't so strict, if you just adapted a little bit, uh, if you just made it easier for everybody to come in so that you could have more people. And, and what he was talking about in that situation was accepting homosexuality as a valid lifestyle and so on. Wouldn't it be easier if you just said, you know, let it let it be and, and, and allow more people to come into your mix. And uh, But that was the idea, right? Wouldn't it be easier if you just take the world's wisdom and what the world says is right, and, and you just accepted that so that more people would be more interested in what you have to offer. It would be easier, wouldn't it, to just go with the flow. Why should I hold to the truth of God's word when we have a whole world that says otherwise and that says it's irrelevant for us today? You know, we may not have the audacity to tell God I don't have to, and you can't make me. But I do expect at times that you have wondered that question, why should I? Why should I? Uh, my guess is that some of you here really enjoy surprises, uh, and some of you would probably say, I don't like surprises a whole lot. And for those of you who would say that you don't like surprises, it probably goes something along the lines of it. It's not that you don't want somebody to do nothing, something nice for you and that you weren't expecting, because we all enjoy that. But, but your argument would go something like this, and that is, I want something to look forward to, to get excited about, right? I, I want something that, that I could see coming, that excites me, that keeps me going. I, I want something that I can look forward to. Most people don't like exercise. How many of you like exercise in here, right? A couple of us, right? Most, most, uh, most, most don't really like exercise. And, and, and even if you go into the mix of people who, who do uh, get out and exercise, they would probably say that I'm not doing it because I want to get hot and stinky and sweaty and smelly and I want to feel exhausted and be, 
trying to catch my breath. Most people wouldn't say that's why they do exercise, would it? They say, I do it because I like the end result. I want to see, I want to see what that scale looks like when I step on it. I want to see what my blood pressure readings are looking like. I want to see my blood sugar regulated. And I want to see, I, I, I want to see myself get off that cholesterol medicine, right? It's, it's about the end picture that keeps them going. And, and, and when you can see that benefit, you, you have something that keeps you moving forward. But sometimes when you can't see that benefit, you get wore down, don't you? And when you can't see that benefit, sometimes you want to give up. So chapter 14 of Revelation, after, after we've just come out of chapter 13 with the beast and, and him giving victory over the saints for a short period of time, chapter 14 is God's sneak peek to the answer, why should I? Why should I? Don't allow the world, don't allow the devil to wear you down. Don't give them that victory. And, and, and I, and I want to be straight with you because, you know, in my personal opinion, God says, because I say so is good enough, right? It should be good enough. It should be good enough just because God said so. But we serve a gracious God, uh, I, and, and God has given us more than just because I said so. And he gives us a sneak peek. Kind of gives us a movie trailer of some of the things that are yet to come. So in chapter 7, we see the ceiling of the 144,000 on earth. And here, as we come into chapter 14, we see them in heaven. Mount Zion, as a, as a reference, uh, and Revelation became a picture of the heavenly city, Jerusalem. We see a picture of the 144,000 in heaven. Only now, they're not going through the tribulation and the persecution and, and, and this battle with the beast and the dragon. Now, we see them blessed and at rest. And we see them joyful in worship. We see them enjoying the presence of the Lamb and of the Father. So why endure patiently? Why continue to be faithful? Why continue to seek God's wisdom? Because the tribulation, the afflictions, the hardships, the persecution, the oppression, the world that we live in is not the end all be all, is it? It's not the end all be all. God is going to have the final word. And we need to believe that. God is going to have the final word. And, and, and eternity, eternity is a much longer time than the mere 50, 60, 70, 80 years we have on earth, isn't it? God's got the final word. So chapter 14 kind of gives us a sneak peek. Uh, we have in this chapter positive reinforcement, reinforcement to the faithful. Uh, keep on keeping on. We have positive reinforcement. We see our picture of us in heaven. We see a picture of the, the blessing and the resting and, and being in the presence of God. But it also gives a negative deterrent to the ungodly. Change now before judgment comes. And what you need to understand about uh, chapter 14, chapter 14 is in a sense kind of a summary. So, so some of the things we see happen in chapter 14, we get a real brief little snippet of and then it's going to, we're going to see it play out in the chapters to come. So it kind of gives us a brief summary, a movie trailer of the following chapters as we look at them going through Revelation. You know, back in, in high school, uh, I uh, had the pleasure of playing basketball. And it just happened that in one game we had an away game, and I don't remember all the details. don't remember who we were playing or whether we won or lost, but I do remember as you know, after the game, you have your locker room, and everybody gets changed and showered, and, and you get on the bus, and you start going home. And, and what I remember is we started down the road to home, and everybody starts looking around for a little bit, and they're like, where's Seth? Seth had missed the bus. He'd been left behind. Now, of course, we turned around, and we went back and picked him up, right? But he'd missed the bus. Now, if you think of chapter 7, just in, as a quick review, we talked about how the 144,000 is most likely a symbolic number. Now, not everybody interprets it that way, uh, but you can go back and, and listen to the sermon on chapter 7 uh, about how the symbolism of that number reflects a large but complete number. In other words, that reassurance that no one who belongs to God 
no one who has the lambs in the Father's name written on their foreheads, none of them will be left behind because God doesn't forget his own. You might also check out Isaiah chapter 49 uh, where it talks about how a, a mother might forget. But I will not forget, God says. I engraved you on the palm of my hand. God will not forget his own. So when you begin asking that, thinking that question or feeling, why should I? Well, one thing is you don't want to miss the bus home, right? You don't want to miss the bus. And so Revelation 14 gives us that picture of home, which for the Christian is, is heaven, right? We're, we're aliens, we're strangers in this land. And, and I look out over here and there is no stranger bunch, right? See, we got to have a little humor in Revelation, right? Heaven is where our citizenship truly is, and we don't want to miss the bus home. Uh, but not only do we encounter a vision of the people of God in heaven, but they're singing with exuberant joy. And sorry, PowerPoint didn't uh, agree with me. I wanted that picture to fade at the same time that that popped up because it kind of is a mismatch, but uh, it wouldn't let me do both on that picture. But we see this, this picture of exuberant joy in verse 2. I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. And we might ask, well, what is this sound? Well, the sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. In fact, it's a picture of some of the worship. Now, if you go to uh, Revelation chapter 19, 6, you'll see where the multitude is, is worshiping God and singing hallelujah. And it's the same language that's used here in verse 2. Also, uh, we see the picture of the harps, and in verse 3, we see that they're singing a new song. So we have a picture of exuberant worship that's taking place. And it's a new song, sung only, or learned only by the redeemed. Now, I wonder what would happen if I were to come over here. Now, I just have a question. I wonder how many of you would wonder what I just told Amanda. I knew Hannah would because she doesn't want to miss out on anything, right? But you know, there's something in us that doesn't want to be left out, isn't there? Even if it is none of our business, right, Hannah? There's something in us that doesn't want to feel like somebody knows something that we don't know or that somebody's getting to experience something that we haven't gotten to experience. So the first thing I want you to see is, is it's, it's a new song. As much as we enjoy the old, and as much good as in the old, it is scriptural to sing a new song, isn't it? As much as we enjoy the old, it's a new song. Because worship is not something that should become stagnant. God is doing new things. And, and the new song reflects some of the new things that God is doing. But it's only the redeemed. Only the redeemed can learn this new song because it's only for those who have been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. The rest of the world can't testify to what God has done in their life in the same way. The rest of the world can't talk about uh, how, how they've been covered with his righteousness the same way as we can that they have been redeemed by the grace of Christ. It's a redeemed song, but it's only for those who know Jesus Christ. Everybody else is going to miss out. That's part of the reason why it's so important that we reach out and that we share Christ with our family, with our friends, with our neighbors, with those around us. Because we want them to be singing that new song with us, don't we? But it's a new song for only the redeemed. And you know, as Christians, we always have something to sing about. Don't we? We always have something to sing about. And, and, and when I say that, I don't mean something like, Nobody knows my sorrows, right? Because sometimes that's what we're trying to sing as, as Christians, you know. Boy, woe is me, life is hard. You know, look at what I'm going through. And, and, and I'm not discounting that sometimes we have hardships and sometimes we have difficulties and struggles. And, in fact, if anything, Revelation should tell us that we should be ready for hard times. That just because we're Christians, it doesn't mean we're not going to have tribulation. In fact, it seems to me that Jesus said something like that, didn't it? When something like, in this world, you will have tribulation. So I, I'm not being uh, pretending that, that we're not going to have tribulation, that we're not going to have hard times and difficulties and challenges along the way. 
but despite whatever we face, we serve a great God. A great God who's done great things and who's given us this little movie trailer, this little sneak peek that says the best is yet to come. So hang in there. Endure patiently. Obey God and remain faithful to Jesus Christ because you ain't seen nothing yet. So at the sneak peek, we're kind of reminded why they're able to sing this new song because they've been redeemed. Redeemed means I've, I've accepted what Jesus did for me on the cross. I've been bought with the price, the blood of Jesus Christ. I, I've been purchased for God. And, and accepting Christ, that leads to living for him. So in verses 4 and 5, he continues on and he says, These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They followed the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God in the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Now, in these verses, we need to be, uh, like in all of Revelation, a little bit sensitive with our interpretation. Because when he says that they did not defile themselves with women, he's not downplaying women, and he's not downplaying marriage. But there are those who have interpreted it that way. And he's not saying that, hey, if you're celibate, then, then you're a higher grade of Christian than, than somebody who's married. Because there are some who have interpreted it that way. But let's think about the context of Revelation, the imagery and symbolism of Revelation and how it fits with the scriptures of a whole, as a whole. Because if you check out the Old Testament, you know, one of the things that you'll discover over and over is that God speaks of idolatry, how? as spiritual adultery and as harlotry. If you don't believe me, go read the book of Hosea. Go read the book of Hosea. He speaks of idolatry as spiritual adultery. In fact, even in verse 8, he talks about uh, the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries, speaking of Babylon. So when it says he did not defile, he's, not speak, he's speaking of those who have not given themselves to the beast, who haven't given themselves to the way of, of Babylon, who have not compromised their faith, but have chosen to remain faithful and committed to Christ. Wholeheartedly committed to Christ. And by that, we don't mean Christians who say over here, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus Christ, but over here, they're living very worldly. You know, if you talk about that in the context of a marriage, that's not a pretty picture, is it? And God looks at it the same way. Spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery. To reinforce this, he goes on to speak about how they follow the lamb wherever he goes. You know, and I, I, I thought about that for a moment. I thought, you know what? We're, we're willing to follow the lamb wherever he goes, right? You know, we're willing to follow the lamb to, to church on Sunday morning. It's kind of comfortable here. And, you know, we don't have to turn down our air conditioning if we can enjoy somewhere else for a moment, right? We're, we're, we're fine following the lamb when he goes places that, that we'd like to go and, and, and to be with people that we like to be with. That's kind of a fun place to follow the lamb to. My question is, is are we willing to follow the lamb when he takes us to places that aren't quite so comfortable? Are we willing to follow the lamb when he's kind of putting this nudge upon our heart that, you know what, you really should offer prayer with that person? I would bet that some of you have had that sense at some point in your life and you thought, I don't know about praying out loud for somebody else. That's just, I'm just not something I'm comfortable with. Are we willing to follow the lamb when he says, you know, I, I think you should step up and you've been at the same place in your journey for such a long time. I think you should step up and, and, and seek to be a greater leader in your church. Are we willing to follow him there? To, to, if he says, you know, I think you should uh, be a part of, of facilitating a small group. Are we willing to, to follow him there? Are, are we willing to follow the lamb when he says, you know what, I think you should be a little bit more generous. I'm not going to mention any names, but a couple weeks ago, we happened to go, 22 of us, some of you already know about this, right? 22 of us happened to go to El Toro to celebrate being in the new place. And boy, were we blessed and delighted when all of a sudden somebody came back and said, hey, uh, I was led to pay the bill for all 22. 
lot of you know what I'm talking about, don't you? But you know what that person, God laid it on that person's heart to cover the bill. Now, I don't know about you. I don't like paying dinner for three of us. I look at a bill, I'm like, good grief, it's amazing what it costs to eat out these days. Anybody like that? Right? I don't like it. I'm like, man, is there really that much for three of us to eat and 22 people? God said, do it. And they did it. Are we willing to follow those promptings that God puts on our heart? You know, for many of us, we're not biblically faithful when it comes to giving on a regular basis. Are we willing to follow the lamb when it's not comfortable? When he asks us to go into territory that maybe we've not been in before? Because the reward for following on earth is following into heaven. And if we want to really follow him there, it really begins by following him here. And it goes on and he speaks about how they've been purchased from among men. They've been bought with the price of Christ's blood. And he describes them as first fruits. Now, first fruits, it's an image that comes out of the Old Testament as well. And basically, first fruits is simply this. Hey, we have this lovely harvest that is coming in. We're taking the first portion of that harvest, the best of that harvest, and we're concentrating it to the service of God. Same concept of tithing. We're taking the first and the best, and we're consecrating it to service of God. Here it's equated to, to people, isn't it? To, to give our first and our best and consecrating ourselves to the service of God. Because we've understood that God has purchased us and redeemed us, and when we begin to understand that we've been bought with a price, then we begin to understand that our life is no longer our own. It belongs to Him. And then he goes on and he talks about how uh, there is no lie found in their mouth and, and, and how they're blameless. And some of us might be thinking, well, I, I think I might be disqualified. And, you know, I, I've kind of told a fib here or there. Or I'm certainly not blameless. And, uh, but when you think about what's happening, these are those who did not uh, buy into the deception of the beast from chapter 13. These are those who have refused to call right wrong and to call wrong right. They have integrity and they have character, uh, which should be a mark of God's people. Should be a mark of God's people. And we all know that it's sometimes all too often not. But people should be able to look at us and trust us because we're followers of Jesus Christ. We had, I think it was a Monday night, maybe Tuesday, maybe it's Tuesday night. I think it was Tuesday night. We had a salesperson come by our house. We get lots of them on our doorstep. I don't know about the rest of you. And, and he comes in, and you know what he wanted to do? He wanted to make my house a smart house. He wanted to make my heart, my house a smart house. You know, that kind of where I can get on my phone, and I can check my temperature. I can change my furnace. I, I can check and monitor my things. And, and the best part is, he said, we want to get into this neighborhood. We want to put our signs. We'll install it for free. And all you have to do is pay the monthly bill. I'm like, well, what's the monthly bill? He said, well, it depends how many people in your neighborhood get it. We'll have to factor some numbers, but probably 30 to 50 in that range. And he said, we'll like to make your house a smart house. And I thought, I'm not sure I want my house to be smarter than me, right? I said, I'll talk to Amanda. I said, we don't have any time tonight, which we didn't, because we had Bible study. We had the popcorn in the park. Maybe it was two weeks ago. It must have been two weeks ago. And we had the popcorn in the park. I said, I'll call you back. And he said, no, you won't. You know, uh, the next day, I think around five-ish or so, I called him back. I said, uh, Colton, I said, I don't think we're interested, but thank you for the offer. And he goes, you're awesome. Now, how many times does a salesperson say you're awesome when you tell them you don't want what they're selling? But he said, you're awesome. You actually called me back. He said, nobody calls me back. And you know what I told him? I said, I told you I would. So I did. I also invited him to church. He didn't make it, obviously. But I also invited him to church. Because I wanted to know what it means to be Christian. We should be marked by character and integrity. Let's face it, when it comes to that question and sometimes that feeling of why should I, 
sometimes just having positive reinforcement is not enough, though, is it? We, we see it with our kids. Sometimes just holding out before them rewards not enough. Sometimes, sometimes you need, in addition to that positive reinforcement, you need the fear of punishment to keep them straight. And, and, and for some of you, uh, I hate to say it, but for some of you, you had that idea of positive reinforcement, and you also had that negative deterrent, and it wasn't good enough for either of you, right? You were just a little troublemaker all the way, right? Somewhere God found you, got hold of you. Uh, but what we find in this passage is in, in verses 6 through 11 and 17 through 20, we also see the negative deterrent to the answer, why should I? And we encounter here uh, three angels. And the first is proclaiming the eternal gospel, and he's inviting people to follow God. He says, fear God in what? Give him glory. And then the second angel is giving a clear warning for that which awaits. He's talking about fallen as Babylon the great. And then the third angel says, okay, so we have this first one who says, hey, I'm inviting you to follow God, give God glory, worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, uh, follow the true God, right? The second angel comes on and says, hey, bad things are going to happen. Babylon's about to fall. Then the third angel comes on the scene, and here's my paraphrase. He says, choose wisely. Choose wisely. Because this world system's coming down. Choose wisely. Give glory to the God who created it all. Because everything else is going to fall. Choose wisely. And it's interestingly enough that we discover in, in verse 7 that the gospel, you know, we usually think the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, which it is about how he came and he died and, and, and he paid our price on the cross, which he did, and so we can go to heaven because of his merit and not our own. You know, that's a, a beautiful picture of the gospel. But what we also see here is that the gospel includes that judgment. It kind of goes hand in hand. Because God's judgment will one day make everything right. God's people will one day be vindicated. Every injustice will one day be addressed. You know, judgment is really a good thing when it comes to being the people of God, whom eternity and reward await. It says the hour for judgment has come. And that's a good thing for the people of God. Verse 8, he talks about how Babylon has fallen. Now, for the astute reader, uh, which I know that you guys are, you get into your scriptures and you're very astute and read it very closely, right? For the astute reader, what you're going to discover is Babylon hasn't fallen yet. In fact, we're going to encounter that in like Revelation chapter 18, 17, 18, I think it's 18, uh, where we see a picture of Babylon falling. Remember, we're getting a peak of what's to come. So in verses 9 through 11, it indicates people still have a choice, and he's giving them that warning, don't get the mark of the beast, don't associate with the beast, uh, because they will also experience the wrath of God, and the eternity will be the result of their choice, whether they're identifying with the beast or whether they're identifying with God. But one of the things we need to understand is that when God has spoken, it's as good as done. When God has spoken, it's good as done, and sometimes it's hard to believe that, isn't it? When you're going through the hardship and the persecution and, and when you're going through all these difficulties, it's hard sometimes to stand on the promises of God. I, I imagine that for Abraham, it was a little bit hard to believe that when God said you're going to have a son, that he's going to have a son. It didn't happen that late in life. And, and when God came to Mary and said, you're going to have a, a, a son, I imagine it was a little bit hard for Mary to believe I'm going to have a son, right? That just wasn't the way things were done. When, when Joseph had all these dreams and, and he finds himself in a prison and dungeon in, in Pharaoh's Egypt, I, I imagine he was having a little bit of difficulty understanding the dreams that God had spoken to him years before. You know, this is what we call faith, isn't it? It's what we call faith. When God has spoken, it's as good as done. It might not have happened yet, but it's as good as done. And Babylon here is representative of a world that's opposed to God. Which, in this case, is epitomized by Rome, but not necessarily limited to Rome. We've kind of talked about how, how we can see this picture play out more, uh, more often. And, and for persecuted Christians who are at, at the hands of Rome at this time, it could have been very difficult for them to see Babylon as falling. This world system has fallen. But he says it's going to happen. And guess what? It did, didn't it? And for those first century Christians and for us today, the question becomes, 
will we believe then and will we stand on the promises of God even before they're fulfilled? Will we hang on to those promises before we see them fulfilled? You know, one day God's judgment will be poured out on sin. It will be poured out on those who reject Christ, who, who worship another. But in the meantime, here's those words again. I heard a voice from heaven say, and oh, sorry, in verse 12, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. I'm giving you a sneak peek of the future so we can patiently endure now in the present. And we can continue to obey and be faithful in the present. No, we're not to allow the culture, we're not to allow our circumstances or political correctness to become an excuse for unfaithfulness and sin, which, which so often happens in our world today. So, so as we continue to think about that question, why should I? Well, not only to avoid God's fury, but to look at the promise of verse 13. He says, I heard a voice from heaven say, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Now, we are not saved by what we do, but what we have done for Christ, once we have been saved, is rewarded in heaven. And we need, we need to make sure we get the order right. We're not saved by what we do, but what we do for Christ, once we've been saved, is rewarded in heaven. And, and, and uh, he says, blessed, your deeds will follow after you. Don't expect the world to applaud you for doing what's right. But God will. Sounds something like, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. God notices and God sees. Now you guys are thinking, boy, we still have 14 through 20 to go. Well, here, here's the rest assured, okay? God repeats the message. That's for those of us who who don't get it the first time through, right? Some of us are a little thick-headed. He repeats the message. He just uses a little bit different language. And in these last verses, we see positive reinforcement in verses 14 through 16. We see the negative deterrent in verses 17 through 20 uh, as to why I should follow Christ and Christ alone. And, and in both of these little passages of Scripture, we see a picture of the harvest. The first is a picture of Christ returning on the clouds for his people. We see the white cloud, which is an image for the glory of God. It's also how Jesus went into heaven. And what they say, this is how Jesus will come back, the same way that he went in Acts. It says, one like the Son of Man. It's a reference to Jesus. He has a sickle in his hand, and it's talking about how Jesus is coming back for his people. That's the positive thing, right? Now, now some have looked at this angel, and they said, well, what about this angel that comes out and, and says to him, take your sickle? sickle and reap, but it doesn't sound right for an angel to be telling Jesus what to do. But think about what Jesus said. Of that day and hour, nobody knows but who? The Father. So we have a picture of the angels coming from the temple, out of the Father's presence, and say, guess what, Jesus? It's time. It's time for all these things to be fulfilled. The first harvest is then followed by the harvest of those destined for wrath in verses 17 through 20. And we have a picture of the blood and the wine press and, and uh, the use of hyperbole to reveal the extensive nature of God's judgment upon a world that has consistently chosen to reject him. So in this chapter, God gives to us a sneak peek, a sneak peek of what will play out in greater detail in the chapters to come along with the wonder and the blessing that awaits those who patiently endure in faith and a warning to those who persistently persist. So why should I endure patiently and obey God and hold them faithful to Jesus? God's because I said so should be enough, but he gives us so much more, doesn't he? He gives us this movie trailer, the sneak peek. So live now with the harvest in view cultivate a heart for God, worship Him, love Him, live for Him, and know that whatever afflictions you may endure, that they are nothing compared to the glory that will one day be revealed to those who patiently endure, who obey, and remain faithful. Amen. We'll give you a moment.